Welcome to the Confessions of a Group X Instructor Podcast. For group exercise junkies and enthusiastic classgoers, we'll explore and uncover authentic, thought-provoking, and heartwarming industry education and inspiration from entertaining, badass fitness pros. And now your host, creator of Warrior Rhythm, Warrior Strength, Warrior Combat, and Warrior Kids Group Fitness Brands, Ellen DeWord. Here we grow. And welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for hopping on with me again, or maybe for the first time. My name is Ellen, and today we are going to talk about the beat on cycle. Do you like cycle? I I really feel like everyone loves cycle. They just don't all know it yet. Sometimes it's an acquired taste, <laughs> like red wine was for me when I first tried red wine. I thought it tasted gross. And then now, now I love it. And I think cycle can be the same way. Sometimes you have to go a few times. You might have to try a different instructor. You might need to visit a different style of cycle class, but I really believe everyone deep down loves it, whether they know it or not. And today we are going to dive into some heated issues. <laughs> All right, let's address the heart of the matter. So we're going to talk about putting ourselves in the shoes of a newbie or someone who's never done cycle before, or maybe someone that right now is like, I don't like cycle. You're wrong. I'll never like it. We're going to put ourselves in their shoes. We're going to talk about some misconceptions that need debunking or dispelling. And we're going to talk about how to set students up for success and safety. And then... The two last bullet points for today's episode are the most exciting. We are going to address the elephant in the room. Do we want the party on the bike experience? Or do we want to geek out on watts and terrain and, you know, data, RPM, heart rate zones? What's our style? What's right? What's wrong? Is there a right? Is there a wrong? What if you're an instructor that like might want to experiment or change, but you don't know how, because you've been doing it so long a certain way. And then finally, the best part, we are going to talk about how I'm going to give you every single secret, all my, everything I've got on how to design a balanced ride and an amazing playlist. <laughs> All right, so let's dive in. So putting ourselves in the shoes of a newbie, the um, I think cycle kind of has a bad, or not bad, but a wrong rep. Like, I think people think it's so insanely hard and intimidating and exclusive. I say the word exclusive in it with a with a negative connotation and it's not good. <laughs> um, I think they're afraid to try it. And basically it, it can be an incredibly hard workout. We're using large muscle groups, you know, large muscle groups directly have a strong impact on our heart rate and our cardiac output. So yes, it can be a like ugh, killer workout, but it doesn't have to be. Think about like, people that maybe it's you. I've definitely been there with orthopedic surgeries where it's like one of the first thing your physical therapist will do is put you on a stationary bike. So you're in full control of your resistance. You're in full control of your cadence. Uh, and like, you know, it's actually one of the easiest formats to modify to your fitness level that exists truly. So I think it has this reputation. Conversely, look at something like water aerobics. I think the same thing just the other side of the coin. I have taken and taught water aerobics classes and I have gotten myself so darn anaerobic, like gasping for breath, dying in a water aerobics class because it's like cardio and resistance combined because of the resistance of the, of the water. And I think that has a wrong reputation too, of 
of of of being you know specifically for maybe people that need the help with the buoyancy of the water like um pregnant women or uh, people who are overweight and have uh you know musculoskeletal issues or rheumatoid arthritis or whatever. And so, yes, it can be great for those things and those people for great reasons, but it's not necessarily some like easy workout. And I think it like cycle, sometimes people just make assumptions. And I think it's really important that we dispel those myths and debunk those misconceptions and create that come on in the waters warm uh, environment around our cycle classes. Come on in. It's all right. <laughs> it doesn't bite. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it does, but you know what I mean? So I think it's important as instructors to just be aware that it is a format that can be maybe off-putting people come in like road cyclists. They love to cross train. I'm in Eugene, Oregon. It's a super outdoorsy town like athletes galore, athletes in their seventies and eighties out there hitting the trails, riding their bikes. And so we attract a lot of that type of athlete into our cycle classes that want the cross training. And, um, you know, they come on in with their like specialized water bottles, like specialized, like the brand. And they're like, you know, cycle tights and they're you know, shoes, of course. And basically they're just like missing their helmets. <laughs> and it can be like intimidating if you're not, a, if you don't do that, if you don't cycle and you're a gym member to think like you might not belong in there. So super important that we shed some light on, on that and create that come on in the waters warm thing. Also, um, yeah, just, just, making it clear that it it is it's as easy or hard as you want and being aware okay let's go into setting our students up for success and safety <laughs> you know what you like if you're listening to this podcast and you don't teach group fitness first of all thanks for hanging out with us but i just have to say that group fitness instructors are like little rocket scientists like the stuff that we have to do and have a big personality, the stuff that we have to think about, the stuff we have to do to pull off a great teaching is actually a high, high, high level of skill. So for example, uh, bike fitting people, we have to make quick, quick, instantaneous decisions. When a new person walks into our room, we have to know like, we have to like surmise and some dialogue of course is warranted, but we have to like figure out like, what do they need from us? How much attention do they need to get safely set up to the bike, to know how to use it, to understand the terminology that we're going to be throwing at them through the hour. And also like, what time is it? How much time do I have? Are they two minutes early? Or are they 10 minutes early? Do I have two minutes to bike fit them? Or do I have 10? Or did they show up late? And you know, you've never seen them and they look like they don't know what they're doing and they look like they need help and they're clearly not setting their bike up correctly. How do you, how do you fix? How do you, what do you do? Well, first I'll just start with that one right there. If someone comes in, let's say, and you've already started the warm up, it's absolutely fine. Actually great. If you just like abandon your choreography for your warm up, your regulars know how to get warmed up on a bike. And your regulars respect and understand your role and they know what you're doing. So if you get off your bike and you pull the mic off your face so not everyone can hear what you're saying or you reach down and you, you click the mute button and you help this new person get set up to their bike. The class is very aware that that's happening and very gracious and they don't mind. They're just going to warm themselves up. And you can even say that like you guys are on your own. You regulars are on your own. I'm going to help Sally. It's her first class today. So feel free to just like leave center stage and take care of the newbie. But if you have time before class, ideally you're giving them a proper bike fit. And this is just a podcast episode. It is not a certification. So I'm not going to dive deep into bike fit here. And, uh, but even the way I'm talking about these things, and I'm going to tell you how to make a playlist again, disclaimer, this is not a certification. It's a podcast episode. <laughs> So please don't listen to this episode and be like, I'm going to go teach cycle for the first time tomorrow. Okay. I'm teasing. So with the bike fit, uh, I do that like quick hip height thing 
like, can you just stand next to your bike and, you know, generally gauge the de- generally gauge, like the top of your hip bone to the top of the seat. And just so you know, I'm going to have you probably hop on and off at least once. So don't get comfortable, but, but I like to have you, I like to micro adjust after I macro adjust. So the seat height is a nice like macro adjustment. And then I have them pop on once they're there. I do start from the ground up. So I start with the kinetic chain, like ankle, right foot, ankle, knee, hip. Also, I address the spine, shoulders and ears or head position. So starting at the foot is a perfect time. If you have time, because they're early for class, is the perfect time to mention footwear. A lot of people come to cycle class in like Nikes or running shoes. And honestly, there's nothing worse than a running shoe for a spin class because a soft, flexible sole is um, hard on the foot and the anatomy of the foot while riding. So I mentioned that the, the stiffer the sole of the shoe, the better, like even a cross trainer would be better than a running shoe. And then I mentioned that like, when you fall in love with the class, <laughs> cause you will, cause everyone loves cycle, even if they don't know it. And then you're, you will want to get a cycle shoe, like get the cycle shoe. And if you're an instructor out there that doesn't have cycle shoes, get the shoe. No, you have no idea until you have cycle shoes. You don't know how badly you need them. I know. Cause like once a year I forget them at home. Right. You, you know, you do this too, right? Like once a year you accidentally leave your cycle shoes at home and it's just like, <laughs> it's just like foot pain and death. And like, you just feel sloppy. You just feel like you're wasting all this energy expenditure, like sloshing around on the pedals and the bike. Anyway, it helps this, it helps you like really like harmonize your energy with the bike to be clipped in. And it's the weirdest thing, but yes, if you are listening to this and teach cycle and don't have shoes, get them. And, um, and you need to be familiar with shoes anyway, to help your students that have them know how to clip in and clip out. And side note, I actually do help students that have, when they're like buying shoes for the first time and they come to class, I like get down on the floor and like help them get their feet in. I teach them that whole thing, how to get in, how to get out. Okay. So I started the floor and I didn't mean to go, I don't mean to go on so much about bike fit, but I'm already in it. So I'm going to keep going. I started the shoe. If they're in there, um, they're, they're, let's say they're, they're in their gym shoes. Let's say I address foot placement that the middle of the foot should be centered over the pedal. This is an important thing to say because our students will often just think they need to shove their whole foot into the entire cage. And like, imagine someone has a little tiny foot, like a little tiny, like size six, their shoe is going to go so far forward that it's going to line the arch of their foot up over the middle of the pedal, which is going to be bad biomechanically for them when they stand. So they need to pull their shoe back if they have tiny feet so that the ball of the foot is centered over. And this is all stuff I'm going to address with a newbie coming in as part of bike fit. And then we go, um, so actually, so at this point in my bike fit, I say, can I have you, can I just sit here and watch you pedal for a minute? Uh, And then I have them kind of pedal. Remember all I've had them do so far is stand next to their bike, basically to get that rough macro uh, hip height adjustment. So I watch and I can tell at this point if I need them to hop back off, usually I do, and move their seat any little bit. This is also the perfect time to be like, do you have anything like, do you have any issues like knee pain, back pain, neck pain, anything, you have anything going on with you that you want me to know about? And you know, (laughs) usually, usually people do. And so it's just good to know. It's good to know in the bike fit process, because there's some things we can do to help people, you know, become more comfortable. So anyway, okay. So then I might have them, I might, I might be able to surmise from this pedaling for a couple of seconds, what I need to do. So I might at this point have them hop off I will then adjust the bike for them. Meanwhile, explaining to them how the bike adjusts so that they can do it on their own. Like if it's one of the pinholes or the micro adjustments, whatever it is, you're kind of teaching them how it works. And then once you have it set, I have them like take a picture of the adjustments so that if they come back to a different class or they forget, they know how to set their bike up without me again. So I'll be like, okay, here's where you're adjusted on our bikes that where I, um, where I work, there's like a, letters. So I'll be like, look, you're at letter H here and blah, 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 and all that. Okay. So then once we have the foot 
kind of where we want it. I have them bring the foot to three o'clock, like forward, the middle of the pedal stroke forward, three o'clock. And at this point, I'm checking their knee. I'm moving up the kinetic chain. And if their knee is like way out over their toes, I need to move their seat back because you can adjust your seat and usually your handlebars, but not always up and down and fore and aft. So I might need to slide the seat back. That's that aft. Um, if their knees are too far forward, we want that nice plumb line from kneecap to like where you would, where your shoelaces are roughly. And there's a little bit of room in there forward and back, but um, roughly that's generally the plumb line I'm looking for. And I mentioned it's similar to the mechanics of a lunge and we want to avoid excessive knee flexion, which could be hard, particularly on the front of the knee, behind the kneecap, the patellar tendon, tendonitis areas. So um, it's important safety, the seat, where the seat is, is really important for safety. If someone's seat is too low, their knees tend to bow out to the side, like they're bow-legged. And if they're, which is poor alignment, right? And then if their seat is too high, imagine, okay? Imagine some visuals here. If the seat is too high, as they pedal, their foot has to reach further down as it goes through six o'clock, the bottom of the pedal stroke, and their hip has to literally teeter-totter or drop down. So their hips, if the seat is too high, simply put, their hips are gonna teeter-totter laterally or side to side. Think about where the strain in the body is gonna go if the hips are rocking side to side over the seat because the seat's a little too high. The strain in the shearing energy and force is gonna go into the low back, into the vertebra of the, 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 discs, the disc of the low back. Uh, so seat height, super important. We want like 10 to 30 degrees of knee flexion. Now, if they happen to say that they're, they have a bad knee, having their seat a little on the higher and a little on the further back is going to be more comfortable for them. It's, it's just simple. It's just mechanics. It's just less knee flexion. It's le less knee flexion. So it's like making a set of stairs less steep for them. So there's some wiggle room in there. And then, so once we've addressed the foot and the ankle and the knee and the hip, now we're going to talk about spinal alignment. Now we don't have to be aerodynamic and wind resistance. We're in a studio. <laughs> we don't have to. So we can have a neutral spine and we want a neutral spine. So we're going to hip hinge with a neutral spine, belly button in, pelvic floor strong, and then shoulders are back and head is in alignment. So conversely, our road cyclists actually have to kind of have some funky mechanics on the road to be wind resistant, to, to look at traffic so they don't get hit by a car. So they have to have like cervical extension of the neck to like see the scene, to look for cars. And so we don't have to do that in our room. So in our room, we can actually get into better alignment, safer alignment. So we want that nice long neutral spine. People can take posture breaks whenever. That's something I like to mention in my bike fitting conversation. I like to say you can take breaks whenever. Posture break, water break, bathroom break, any kind of break you want except talk to your neighbor break. I don't want you to talk to your neighbor in here. <laughs> no, I'll talk to you about, I'll mention that in my confession today, okay? So let's see. Bike fit. Um, 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 um. So neutral spinal alignment, shoulders back and down. Do, do, do. Yeah. And then, so then I'm, I did this quick bike fit. Maybe I had 20 seconds to do that. Maybe I had five minutes to do that. And then I also help manage their expectations for the class right here. So this is about setting our students up for safety and success. So I let new people know that I'm like, you know, a lot of new people just come for like 20 minutes, 20, 30 minutes. I love saying that. That means that if they just die on the bike and I'll, let me explain why sometimes people just die on the bike because it is large muscle groups. It is a chat. It is potentially a very hard, vigorous workout, but, but really people don't necessarily know how quickly to engage their energy expenditure 
And if they've never done something like this, it's exhausting. It's the SEDS principle. It's like we, our bodies adapt. Uh, if you're a fit pro listening, you know what the SEDS principle is, but our bodies adapt to the demands we place on them. So if someone hasn't cycled, cycle is going to wipe them out quickly. I don't do double unders or, or like, I don't run. I'm not a good runner. So if I was going to go run around the block, I would die because I'm not conditioned to running. So people who come, who are new, who are not conditioned to cycle are going to fatigue quickly. And they're not necessarily sure how quickly to engage to, 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 uh, like, uh, uh, expend their energy at what rate they should expend their energy. So they might be in your third song, just gassed. So I like to tell them that like 20 minute thing, because then, Hey, if they do want to leave, they don't feel like they failed. I, usually people do stick the whole thing out and then they feel like, huh, I made the whole class. She said a lot of her first timers like leave after 20 minutes. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I just like to give them permission. I like to talk about taking breaks. Um, and then I like to say, is there like, okay, we'll get into styles of teaching soon. And in fact, on the next point here, but kind of depending on the style of your class, like if you are the, um, like geek out on terrain, Watts, whatever, my zone, whatever tech you're using, or if you're that type of cycle instructor, they're going to need some instruction there, like how to use their bikes, like how to read where their watts are, or if you're doing zone training, anything you need to tell them about that or the tech, um, the emergency brake on the bike. I like to mention if your foot comes out of the pedal, how to get it out of the way. So it doesn't, you know, bite you in the calf. Um, so, so anyway, anything they need to know about tech and, and, and terminology, but I don't teach like that, uh, anymore. So I like to just let them know, um, some of like the verbiage they're going to be getting from me and what to expect. So in a nutshell, I'll say something like, listen, each song, I'm going to let you know what we're going to be doing kind of in advance. And if I say that we're going to add a gear, a gear is totally subjective. It's enough that you notice an increase. It's not necessarily a full turn or quarter turn. It's enough that you felt it get a little bit harder. So it's on you. It's subjective. You know, you can go as easy or hard as you want today. And on that note, like if we're sitting a lot and it's uncomfortable for you or really hard for you, your butt, your, by the way, your butt's going to hurt in here too until you start coming regularly, um, come out of the saddle. It's okay. And if I'm standing a lot and that's uncomfortable for you, have a seat. It's okay. It's okay. This is for you. And then um, I do like to tell them about terminology. So like, I'm going to say, add a gear. I'm, I might say like in this next song, we're going to add three gears. That just means I'm going to be asking you to add resistance three times. We're going to have jumps. We're going to have this. We're going to have that. So I give them an idea of language I'll be using. I really am just like putting their mind at ease, letting them know that they're going to be successful and that they're going to have fun. Okay. So now let's get into the juicier parts of this episode. Do we want the dance party on the bike or do we want to geek out on like techie stuff and be like more authentic road rider? There's not a right or wrong. There's just not a right or wrong. I manage the group fitness department at our club. And I want to give you yoga as an example here. We have different styles of yoga. We have Ashtanga. You guys know about Ashtanga? 90 minutes, classically. Same routine, classically. We have Hatha yoga. You hold things longer, breathe, count breaths. We have vinyasa flow. Um, I want to add yin. Yin is like body weight, deep stretching, no strength, but it's not the same as restorative. Okay, you get where I'm going with this. There's different styles, very different experiences very different styles of yoga, but they're still yoga. So at your facility, your studio, your club, unless you are at a boutique, like the, some of the, I'll talk about boutiques in a second. Like 
Yeah. I think you should have multiple styles. I think you should have two styles. You should have a style for the people that want the authentic, like three variable thing. And I think you should have a style for the people that want to party on the bike. And I'm going to put a pin in that and back up. All right. When Soul Cycle came onto the scene, I remember seeing the craziness. And I literally said to myself, by the way, I didn't say this to the world. I said this in my own head. Uh, it's bullshit on a bike. That looks like bullshit on a bike. And then there was other, you know, um, similar types of boutiques that became popular. So these boutique cycling experiences really profoundly and very impressively changed the landscape of what we know as cycle today. They changed the appetite. They changed the game. Super disruptive in the industry. And I sat there in all my cycle piety, looking down my nose at them for a, quite a while, maybe a couple of years, thinking it was bullshit on a bike. And meanwhile, this is so long ago, pr prior to me creating the Warrior Instructor Academy, this is when I was a master trainer working with Beachbody. And one of the formats that I was teaching and presenting and certifying people in and blah, 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 was, was called PIO. And I was at this kind of junction in my life, sometimes running up against yoga purists that would look at what I was doing. And I'm sure in their head was thinking that's bullshit on a yoga mat. I'm sure. So anyway, I loved Pio because, um, I didn't really have the temperament. I like really had an appetite for like wanting to be good at yoga. I'm super flexible. I was born flexible. I like look like a yoga girl when I move, but I like had an appetite. I wanted to be like a yogi, but I just didn't have like the temperament basically. Like I didn't have the personality for yoga, at least at that time and season in my life. And so what I was offering and, you know, it's also something it's, something where your rhythm provides for people today is an alternative. It's, um, it's, it's, it's an alternative. And, um, actually where your rhythm has taken that alternative to much further extreme. Um, it's an alternative for people that wish they liked yoga, but if they're honest, they really struggle with it. So it's like this. Um, so anyway, my point is I had the biggest light bulb go off in my head that I was being the biggest hypocrite in the world. It was, I just can't believe what a hypocrite I was. Here I was, people with yoga purists, um, and I get it. Like, I get it. Yoga is like, I've done this since then. I've gone through my full, um, you know, registered yoga teacher training, which is thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours. Like I get it. It's a huge investment and it's easy to get like, honestly, like puffed up on pride about it. And like, this is the only way, and this is the right way. And, um, you know, I was basically doing that with cycle. I was doing that with cycle. And once I realized I was being a hypocrite, I was like, it opened up my mind. It opened up my mind. I was like, okay, so here's what I was taught with cycle. I was taught that all we were allowed to do, and I'd, I'd gotten certified four times because <laughs> I'm like an, I'm like an education junkie. Um, I'd been certified four times and all my certifications were basically like, if you wouldn't do it on a road, do not do it in your classroom. So you wouldn't do something like a jump or a deep hover, or you certainly wouldn't do some funky patterns with your hands and clapping and <laughs> all kinds of stuff like that. So basically we were allowed in my first formative and many years of teaching cycle to only manipulate three variables position, which was only like seated or standing speed, which was only go faster or go slower and um, speed, the cadence, 
position, up or down, and um, resistance, load. That's it. Are we adding resistance or taking it off? Are we speeding up or slowing down? And are we sitting or are we standing? That was it. We literally had to just entertain our classes with our personalities because we certainly couldn't do it with a variety of moves. So when I realized I was a hypocrite and that I was, people were looking down their noses at me like, that's not yoga. And I realized I was looking down my noses like, that's not cycle. My mind opened. Oh, thank God. And I was like, there's got to be people that find my class boring if all I'm doing is manipulating three variables. And again, I'm not saying that's the wrong way to do it. I just was like, huh, I don't have the temperament for yoga because I struggle with boredom. Like, I just was like, such a regret. And I was like, oh my gosh, I want to change. I want to evolve. I want to be trendy. I want to do new stuff. I'm scared. My class, I already have a class, like a big class. They love me. Like, what if they don't want to evolve with me? Like, what if they don't like change? You know, people don't typically like change. So if you are listening to this and you teach a traditional cycle class and are interested in playing with maybe getting more trendy, I've been there. So how I did it successfully was little by little incrementally and with open, honest conversation with my classes about what I was doing. Like I talked to them. The industry is different now. I want to be trendy. (laughs) I want to do cool things. I want to play. I want to try new things. I want to evolve. I want to grow. And so it started little. It started with like tricep presses and then, and like chest presses and jumps and tap backs. Like it started very simple. And then I saw and was inspired by their um, excitement. And so we just have continued to evolve to today where we're full blown party on a bike. Like I'm tightly choreographing songs to the eight count with all kinds of fun uh, movement, arm movements and stuff like that. Um, Hip movements, all kinds of stuff that keep the mind engaged, which helps keep your mind off the clock. So one of the advantages to um, playing with and choreographing your rides and making it more of a party on a bike is it does tend to make the time fly by quicker because people have to like focus. If you give them a pattern of like, um, I do it very differently. Sometimes I'm just choreographing to the song itself. What does this song sound like I should be doing? And there's like, there's this Brianna song where I, um, you know, it literally, it, the song told me what to do with my shoulders. <laughs> and I did this perfect single, single, double, like shoulder drop thing. And then, so it's kind of like that. Sometimes the song just really dictates what it feels like what it wants me to, to do. And then other times I'm, I'm coming up with like a very fun pattern that fits an eight count that I'm imposing into the, into the music. So anyway, uh, let's go back to this whole topic of, do we want to party on a bike or do we want to geek out on watts? Now also the industry has also evolved in really cool ways and with cool new, um, wearable tech and gamification and screens and rooms and zone trainings and all different, like there's the industry has also evolved with the more technical type of cycle class too, which is really cool too. And maybe that's what your facility has and wants to do. Maybe that's your appetite. And I really do believe just like there's an appetite for Ashtanga and there's an appetite for yin yoga. I really think there's an appetite for writing like more of an outdoor cyclist and getting into the tech and all that techie, nerdy, geeky stuff. And I say that with affection, like I'm a nerd and a geek, I promise. Or, and I think there's also an appetite for the fun party on a bike. So decide where you're at. We are at a, I mean, you know, maybe, maybe you're with me. Maybe you haven't been at this crossroads. Um, but yeah, you can change it. You can change, you can change and you can evolve and you can grow and um and do things differently and i um, was excited to share with you that now one of my confessions today i have a few confessions i'm actually behind i was going to sprinkle some confessions in 
all throughout this episode. And here I am about to get into how to design a ride in a playlist. And I haven't confessed anything. Um, okay, well, let me back up on confessions. I wanted to confess to you that I met my husband in a cycle class. <laughs> And he's like a shy type. So he was like hiding in the back row and he's ridiculously handsome. I'd actually already heard about him and his handsomeness from one of my other girlfriends who was like, damn, <laughs> there's this guy. Anyway, I was like, oh, I bet that's him. It was him. So anyway, he was hiding in the back of the room. He wasn't hiding in the back of the room, but he was in the back of the room. And... I make a habit. This is a great habit, by the way. Take it, please. I make a habit of walking through and talking to each person on their bike before class is starting. So at that particular club, this was like, oh my gosh. I mean, we've been almost married 15 years. So this was a long time ago, but I would walk the aisles that that particular club had three rows of bikes. So I would walk the rows and, you know, I would like kind of put my hands on the tips of the handlebars and talk to whoever was on the mic and to say, hi, thank you for coming or whatever. Like I would make some type of personal connection. I call those touch points with each human being in the room. So I was walking through and I met him. And I remember that he said something about the scars on my knees. It was like the first thing he ever said to me. <laughs> Not the best pickup line. And you can't even see those scars anymore because I'm covered in tattooed leg sleeves. But anyway, that's how we met. And I was teaching water aerobics at the time. Also, I was doing like a six month sub job for someone. He started coming to my water aerobics classes. I'm like, he, he must like me. <laughs> All right, back to confession number two. I meant to confess that in the beginning of this episode. This is confession number two today related to styles of cycle. I don't, I would say I'm only like, 89, 90% party on a bike person. There are certain things in the party on the bike classes, the boutique classes that I've taken. There's a couple of things that are not for me. It doesn't mean they're not for you. And it doesn't mean I think they're bad, but they're not for me. One of them is the like frenetic pace of like 110 RPM constantly. I don't personally like to cycle that rapidly. I like to go more in the 50 to 100 RPM range. Like I love me some 74 RPM. Oh, I love me some 74 RPM. It just feels so good. It's like perfect. It's like the sweet spot for my body and resistance. And I love it anyway. So there's some things I'm just making another confession for you. And I'm not crazy about those manic cadences often if they lead to bouncing like bouncing around in the saddle and anytime you feel like or you see yourself or see someone bouncing in the saddle or bouncing around it it actually means they've exceeded their maximum efficient cadence like they're wasting energy and they're risking injury so yes i like to sprint and go rabid fast as a, as a sprint, as an interval, a controlled fast as I can go sprint. And yes, I might get above 110 RPM, but I don't like to conduct my whole class every song, like super fast, which has been my experience with, um, the little bit, I haven't done much, but the little bit of boutiquing, boutique cycling that I've done. The other thing I don't like confession about some of the boutique experiences that I've had in regards to adding weights. And I'm a fan of like, fine, add the weights there. I like, yes, whatever. I don't like when the move, the exercise is not, how do I say, I don't know how to say this gently, like is just wrong. <laughs> so for example, on a bike, I've been asked to do things like do a chest press. So we're sitting straight up and we have dumbbells or a bar. I've been in a class that had a bar that was like attached to the bike that you pull out. And with the bar or the dumbbells, we push forward. 
So anyway, those of you who are fit pros and educated, you know that this is purely shoulders because of the angle that we are against gravity. We would literally have to be on our back at that angle or using a band. Like it just doesn't work. It's not a chest press. It's all shoulders. Or I've been asked to do chest flies. Again, it's all shoulders. Um, so I just think we need to call a spade a spade and call things by what they really are. Like what's the prime mover here? Not chest. Um, I could give you other examples, but those are the things that I'm like, that's why I say I'm like more of like a 90% trendy girl, but um, I don't like the crazy speed and I don't like name. I don't like an exercise that isn't truly working the muscle group. It, I think we should call a spade a spade. Um, I had another example there, but I can't remember what it is. Should we get into the most fun part of this podcast? how to design a playlist. I'm going to give you all my secrets. I'm going to give you my exact process. I hope it works for you. And, you know, you might use it for another format um, or, you know, your Friday night party list. I don't know. <laughs> all right. So the first thing I do is I keep an ongoing song, like dump, like a massive Every time I hear something wonderful, and I hope you use Shazam or SoundHound, some kind of an app that helps you find songs when you're out shopping or at a movie or whatever, and you hear a song that you love, um, that you can grab that song. So I use SoundHound. Um, and so I'm always collecting. I'm always listening, always collecting and putting them in this massive playlist. that's probably like seven hours long. So from there, if it's time for me to create a new ride, I start to pull songs from different genres with different vibes and different feelings and different speeds. And I'll get a little more specific about that in a minute, but I want variety. So I'm gonna start to pull songs from my massive list into an actual, like I'm making my playlist. And I want to make that playlist that I'm creating from the massive one about 55 minutes. Well, actually I'm only teaching 45 minutes now. I, so, so I want to make that playlist about 45 minutes, including it's in warm up and cool down. So, so I've pulled a song in there that I think will work for a warm up, And I've pulled a song in there that I think will work for cool down. And I want it to be approximately the length of my class. Now, this is just a rough draft. We can change it. I can decide I don't want one of the songs. I can decide I need to go back to that massive list and swap one out. But basically at this point, I now have a new playlist that's 45 minutes long. Okay. This is my first step. I'm not married to it. I can always make changes, but I have a general idea. It's the right length of time. I do something that I learned this from my friend. Um, her name's Mickey Baggio, one of my original mentors, bosses. She actually hired me for my first cycling class ever. And I love her. P.S. She is now an Orange Theory coach and still one of my dearest friends. She lives in Portland, Oregon. I remember her telling me, give the songs a 20 second test. If you don't feel like moving, dancing, running, if you don't feel like moving your body in 20 seconds, don't use it in a cycle class. And I've really stuck to that. that that's a great litmus test. So I give every song that 20 second test because we don't want people zoning out or getting bored in our classes. And the music is a huge part of the experience. Okay. So, um, then once we've culled our favorites, we've put them in the playlist, we've given them that 20 second test and we don't want to change any of them because they're all great. Then I open a Google doc. This can be a notepad up on your phone. I don't know what you want this to be, but it should be digital and it should be in a cloud. Gone are the days where we want to do this on pen and paper or on note cards, because what if you spill coffee or lose them? do it in, in a cloud on some type of doc. I like Google docs. So now I'm creating the lesson. I give it, you know, lesson, you know, I give it its title for the class and, um, and 
so then I take the songs I have on that list kind of dumped in there and I, I write down the name of the song. Um, PS, I do count beats per minute. I do use a, the B, a BPM free app on my phone. You just tap, you just tap the, your cell phone and it counts the beats per minute. You just tap it for like 15 seconds. And I like to know, and you know, if you just double your, your, your beats per minute, you have your RPM. So if a song is 60 beats per minute, it's 20 RPM because they're going boom, boom. They're hitting, they're doing right, left for each, each beat is, um, every two, every, you know what I'm trying to say. You, you double it. <laughs> That's all you need to know because you have to go right foot, left foot or left foot, right foot. Okay. So I do like to do count RPMs. I've been teaching long enough that I can design a class like laying on my couch. <laughs> and I know like I can tell like the song would be for a, a slow climb. This song would be perfect for intervals. Um, I can tell by listening to a song, like I can basically tell you pretty darn accurately what the RPM is just by listening without even checking myself. So this gets easier with time and experience, but basically I write down the names of the songs and what I think I want to do to them parenthetically, like hills, intervals, jumps, whatever. And this relates to what we've already talked about today, what kind of style you are. So this, this becomes very different maybe for you than it is for me, but you're going to write down what you feel like doing to that song. So then you're going to go into this fun, like puzzle of rearranging your playlist for variety. You want to avoid redundancy. And there's quite a few things that can become redundant that you want to avoid. One of them is position. So we want to avoid having like two back-to-back -back songs where you're doing like standing the whole song, unless it's very intentional and there's a reason you're doing it. For the most part, you want to think about that newbie that might really have a hard time being out of the saddle and they're hanging onto their handlebars for like dear life. They've got their elbows propped up, they're crunched down and their shoulders are up by their ears and they're just hanging on for dear life. We got to think about that person. So uh, spreading out. If there's a couple songs that, you know, I, I just, I listen to it. I'm like, I know I want to stand on this song the whole three minutes. I want to stand. I can tell, or like, um, you know, another song where you're just like, I, it feels like a standing song. I feel like I would do standing runs, spread those out, spread those out. We're rearranging. We're doing our Sudoku puzzle now. Then you also want to spread them out in terms of cadences. We don't like, let's say you happen to have, I rarely do a song this slow, but every once in a while I'll do a song that's like 50 RPM, which is a hundred beats per minute. So every once in a blue moon, I'll do a song that slow. Obviously it would be a very heavy song, but um, I wouldn't want that next to like a 60 RPM. Like I, I don't want two slow songs in a row because then they're going to be like, want, want, and their heart rate's going to come down. So I want to spread those out, put a faster cadence in there. I love a good 96 RPM for seated. I love that. So put some variety in, avoiding redundancy, drag, drag, drag. We also want to um, vary the type of genre of music so that, and, and, and specifically, you know, I like to sometimes like push the envelope with my music and my song choice and do something a little out of the box. I like that about myself. <laughs> so maybe it's the lyrics of a song are kind of like, oh, these might, these might offend somebody. So let's say I have a couple songs like that on a playlist. I don't want to put them back to back. I don't want to put them back to back. I want to put something like chill that I know will not offend anyone right after that first one <laughs> so that they, they forget about it. <laughs> Um, or sometimes like I've done like some screamo, like I push the envelope with like a crazy rock out song that I know is kind of niche and it's not going to be everyone's vibe. I've even done, although it's not the best genre for cycle classes, 
I've even done a cool country song. There's a couple out there that are pretty kind of crossover cool with big beats and, um, you know, spread that, spread that stuff out, spread that stuff out. If it's like a bunch of like heavy EDM, too much of that in a row is going to maybe annoy someone that doesn't like EDM. So variety is really important. Different genres are different, important. You're dragging, you're moving things around so that you're not out of the saddle too much. You're not doing too many of the same drills. It's not the same what you plan on doing. Like, let's say you have long sprints in a song. Like, I wouldn't advise putting the next song long sprints. Um, So finally, as you're arranging the songs, think about this. We want the last song to be a grand finale. And I mean that, like, think fireworks. When you go watch fireworks, there's like the grand finale at the end. Your last song should be your best song, period. The warm-up is so important. And before I go further there, I also put about mm, five songs, about 15 minutes worth of music, because I show up to the classroom 15 minutes early to meet people and set up, set up the room, set up the ambiance. I put 15 minutes worth of music before my class starts at the front of my playlist. These songs are very important, but they don't want to be the, they don't want to be, you don't want those songs to be better than anything in your ride. They should be the songs that you almost wanted to put in your ride, but they weren't quite good enough, but you really liked them. They should be mood elevators Because people come to the club, like not in the mood to work out. Like I, for one, I do (laughs) like daily. I don't love working out confession. I don't thank God for my job because I love it once I'm there. So anyway, people are like that. A lot of people are like that. A lot of people are like that. You're helping them. You're helping set their mood. You're helping them get their dopamine and serotonin and their endorphins up by the music you're playing when they arrive. So that playlist is really, that part of your playlist is really important, but don't let it be better than anything in your ride. It's the appetizer. It's like the foreplay. Okay. Then the warm up song is really important because it's hopefully scooping them heart, mind, and soul into what you're doing. So it needs to be a very strong, upbeat, mood, elevating, fun, um, you know, big beat song. So we have our grand finale, grand slam at the end. We've got something that we know is going to put them in a good mood and make them want to really move, even if they didn't want to as a warm up. So what about all that space in the middle? So we also want to think about like, midway through class, third of the way through class, two thirds of the way through, maybe midway. Where do we want to pepper in some other like heavy hitting fire songs that you just know your class is going to be like drooling over? You want to put those in there too at critical windows in class where they're wanting to check out or zone out or they're tired 20 minutes in, 30 minutes in. And then follow those up, those like gasping for breath type songs that are all out exertion. Back those up with things that are a little bit more chill. Let your class be peaks and valleys. We don't want to be rah, rah the whole time. Also, I tend to put in at least one song that is soulful and lyrical. Maybe it's not intense at all. It's just beautiful. The lyrics are inspiring. And when I find a song like that, team, I just don't talk. We talk too much. We cue too much in cycle class. We, we kill it. We we kill it. They're not, they're in their own world, like almost no other format. They're just in their own world. It's so much not about us in that format, especially like when I teach warrior rhythm, they need to be looking at me. They need to be watching me because there's a lot going on and a lot of poses and tricky transitions. And in cycle, no, they, they just, they just want to be in their bubble. They're thinking about them. And that's what we want them to be thinking about. And so take at least a song where you don't talk. Take some other songs where you don't talk for a minute of that three and a half minutes. It might feel awkward if you're used to talking all the time while you're teaching. First of all, your students are probably drowning you out. 
tuning you out because it does become very white noisy in a cycle class if the instructor is constantly speaking. You are less impactful if you are constantly talking. And this format, like none other, well, maybe not none other, but like maybe not yin, <laughs> but this format, like almost none other, allows you the ability to be quiet and let music and let their own experience lead their way. It's so much more powerful. So if you can find a song that is chill or inspiring um, to, to make that your be quiet song, make that your be quiet song. And if, you, if, you're, if you're used to talking constantly, it will feel awkward for you. You'll feel like, oh my gosh, they're looking at me. They want me to talk. I've been quiet for 30 whole seconds, but I promise you they are not feeling that way. I promise you they are not feeling that way. They love it. Okay. So finally, I have for myself a legend that I've created of symbols. I've actually, as of this year, I've 2023, I've, um, I use emojis. I've set up emojis and I made, I've made a legend. And so my notes that I use don't even have words. And so I just start to then, once I have that playlist designed, how I think it's going to be perfect with the dragging and dropping to avoid redundancies, to add variety, to add drama, to take them on an emotional journey. Once I have it the way I think I want it, then I start to then program it. And I use my emojis, my legend for whatever the things I'm doing. And if I make up, I'm always making up new combos now, crossing over, triple pulse in the middle, then cross over, drop your right elbow, drop your left. I'm coming up with new stuff all the time now. So I have to add to my legend almost every time I create a new ride. And so basically I'm going to listen to each song and look for the changes in the music, the big beats, the big tops of phrases, where are the choruses, where's the bridge and program them. And I really like predictability. So if we're always going to do a combo of like, um, let's see, just last Friday, I taught one of the combos I taught was two chest presses, one tap back, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That was, and, and I did that with every chorus. And so I like, I like to find parts of the song, or maybe it's every verse. You're going to sit on every verse or do a single leg drill on the verse. Um, continuity, finding patterns in the song and then programming so that when you get to that part in the song or it repeats, you do the same thing. Um, they like that subconsciously or consciously. It depends on how aware they are of, um, the music and all that stuff. And, um, yeah, those are my best tips on how I make an amazing ride. And then guess what? Like, like good music begets good music because once I have a beautiful ride, you can click on, on Spotify, you can click enhance and enhance will suggest some very specific songs based on very specific songs that it thinks you're going to like. So if you have like four songs that you're like, oh my gosh, I love this so much, enhance it, find more like it. Similarly, it does make song suggestions, recommended songs based on your playlist underneath your playlist. So those, you guys, are my best tips and best practices for how to create a balanced ride uh, that is safe and that is fun. So let's just review before I say goodbye to you today. We took some time with this episode to think about putting ourselves in the shoes of a newbie and just being aware that generally people think a cycle is going to kick their ass and that it's going to hurt their butt and that they don't fit in. So how do we, how do we work at saying, come on in the water's warm, you can work as hard as you want. And then, um, just yeah, debunking that, that myth that, that it's for elite cyclists. Cause it's just not, I am not a cyclist. I am a cycle instructor and a good one, but I'll never be on a road bike. I'm scared of being hit by a car. I won't do it. 
I would rather be on a beach cruiser in San Diego with a little cute little basket with some snacks in it like that. That's the kind of cyclist I am. So let them know it's for everybody. And then it's low impact. It's, it's really joint friendly for people that are maybe struggling. I mean, of course, I don't want to speak out of practice and I don't want you to, but if it's okay with their doctor, if they are rehabilitating something and if it's okay with them, it's a great modality typically for people and, and especially people with upper body issues, like a shoulder issue. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's something that, um, is worth considering. Um, we talked about bike fit. Oh my gosh, this podcast kind of felt like a certification. <laughs> I didn't mean it to, you are not certified, but we did talk about bike fit from the floor up and just like how to do the math quickly in your head to like, how do you take care of the new person as they come into the room? what goes into that. And then, um, I really want to challenge you to consider your style. Is it time for a change? Is it time, time for a makeover? I say this as I'm looking at my hair, I still have eighties hair. (laughs) Is it time for you to maybe try something different? I don't think there's a right or a wrong way, but you know, I'm really happy with my decision to evolve. Um, and then you know, I hope I inspired you with some tips on programming and uh, how to design a balanced ride and pick amazing songs. So, okay. I was going to give you sort of a story for my confession. I know I already confessed that a couple things, but I was going to tell you a story about a class that I had This is probably at the very least 15 years ago. And I just like didn't have class control, if you know what I mean. So my command presence was lacking. And it's really hard to get that back. And and basically, like to put it bluntly, people were just talking during my class a lot. And I want to just share with you how I handled that Uh, because, and this is, this could be applicable to other formats that you might teach too, but it was a situation that, that was really hard and really challenging for me that I handled well. So it started with for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, (laughs) my blood pressure was just rising. Like I, I would, I would, I didn't enjoy teaching this class. I hated teaching it. I felt like they weren't listening to me because they were talking. They weren't listening to me. (laughs) And it was so frustrating because this is, oh my gosh, this is how long ago it was. I just remembered I was buying my playlist on Napster. (laughs) Remember Napster? Oh my gosh. And so anyway, we spent like a dollar 29 cents per song. And it was like 13 songs or 15 songs or whatever for the hour long class. So basically I just remember I was spending about $20 per ride. Plus I was new then I can design a ride really quickly today, but back then I wasn't, I I wasn't as, um, as, as good. And so I would spend hours, hours, like four hours at least to make a ride that I'm not getting paid for. Plus the $20 for the music. It's like a huge, inv- it's like a labor of love. It's, it's just a labor of love. And I would go and then they weren't paying attention. They were just talking and I hated it. And like, I, I wanted to quit. And as an aside, I have a personal rule and I hope you'll steal this rule from me. I would never give up a class without giving it six months of consistently, unwaveringly feeling like I needed to give it up. So you know how sometimes you want to give up a class, but then you teach a good one because everyone came and it was fun and you're like, maybe I want to keep it. No, six months. So I'm like not a quitter. Like I won't quit and I'll do the work. And honestly, it takes sometimes six months to a year to even start to build a class. And so I was not going to quit but I wasn't enjoying it. And I knew I needed to address it. So finally I addressed it one time and I never had the issue again. I 
basically got there and I just stood next to my bike until it became so awkward because it was past the start time. I was just waiting for everyone to stop talking. Like school teachers, I feel like do that. Isn't that a school teacher thing? I think that's where I got that. I think it's a school teacher thing. And I just stood there until you could hear a pin drop. And I said, team, we are in a relationship. In my mind, it feels kind of like a marriage. I'm committed. We're, we're definitely in a serious relationship. You come in here, me come in here, this class. And just like marriage, sometimes feelings come up and we need to communicate about them so we can move on. And I just told him the truth. I just said, I said, I don't enjoy being here. I want so badly to give you an incredible experience. I want so badly for the atmosphere in here to be palpably intense and fun. Not social. And know that I have compassion. Know that this is my only social outlet in my entire life. I have three little babies. <laughs> this is the only social life I have. The club, the gym. But I'm asking you to save your conversations, your social part, for before class, for after class, for in the locker room, for in the lobby, for between classes, for filling your water bottle at the water fountain, for walking into the parking lot, whatever. But I don't want it in here. And I said, I said, I invest my own time, hours of time and my own money because I love you. Imagine doing that. Imagine that you cared so much about something and you were going to give a speech and you had 26 people in the room. I say that because there was 26 bikes. You had 26 people in the room, in a small room. You cared so much about this and you loved them. And you practice and practice and practice and practice. And then you show up and you start to give your speech. And people are talking. Like that's what it feels like. And so today, can you try this with me? Can you try to bring a different energy, a focused energy and save your chit chat? for when we're done here. And it fixed it. That wasn't really a confession. It was just a story. Um, I know as instructors, we, from time to time and club to club or class to class, we do struggle sometimes with maintaining class control. Maybe it's someone's on their cell phone the whole time during class or whatever, but yeah, there's different ways to address it. That one worked for me. Anywho. Thank you for taking the time to put me in your ears today. I will see you next time. <laughs> Thank you for joining in on the Confessions of a Group X Instructor Podcast. If you're interested in becoming a Warrior Rhythm, Warrior Strength, Warrior Combat, or Warrior Kids Instructor, go to warriorinstructors.com. But if you want more and found this episode amazing, please give us a rating. And with a simple click to subscribe, we'll invite you back to our next episode. So remember, be brave, be bold, be blessed. And above all, listen, learn, love.